ladies and gentlemen. I hope everybody's had an adequate intake of uh, tea and coffee and everyone's wide awake because this is going to require all your sensory powers. It's hard to imagine the retail world of the future. You've got customers who are so wayward, unpredictable. Well, even right here at the IRF, you've got a bunch of people who say that don't listen to customers. Another group that say, well, listen to them, but don't overdo it because customers don't know what they want 20 years from now. Well, to help you cut through that clutter, we'll be having three presentations today. And I think at the end of it, um, you'll have a clearer sense of what 2032 could look like for retail and in terms of customer choices. You've already had the introduction, so let's get right on with the presentations. Let's pick based on the technological compatibility. Who's going first? Uh, Shalish? Good morning, everybody. Uh, and very good mo morning to the panelists here. You know, a discussion like this, when you look 20 years ahead, can be daunting. Because like Jayanth was saying yesterday, we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what's going to happen a week from now. Forget about 20 years from now. Uh, my reply to Jayanth is that, Forget what's going to happen a week from now. I don't even remember what happened a week back. <laughs> so, so we have these multiple complex questions. We don't know what happened last one week. We don't know what's going to happen a week from now. And here we are trying to intelligently discuss uh, what's going to happen uh, 20 years from now. But I'm going to attempt. And uh, all three of us are going to attempt. And let's see what comes out of it. Uh, what I'm attempt attempting here is I want to look at what was happening 20 years back. Very quickly, uh, that was that would be year 1992. Uh, just quickly uh, go through it. What was going on in India in 1992? Then quickly come today as to what's happening today, and then try to extrapolate what we believe go can happen in year uh, 2032. Now, <clears throat> that's the first uh, part of my discussion. Second part is some uh, discussion on the kind of organization we will see in uh, uh, 20 years from now. And third point is. Uh, something about the PNL, eventually about the business, what kind of margin, what kind of sizes, what kind of multiply, some comments and some projections on that. So these are the three points I'm going to cover uh, in my part of the uh, presentation. Let's look back at 1992. And uh, I was uh, fortunately, unfortunately in the industry. I just joined after my MBA in 1992 uh, uh, and joined a group called Madura, which was then and it still is a leading textile garment company. Uh, when I look back to 1992, there was no brand. Uh, my company was planning to launch Van Heusen and they were trying to uh, start working on a brand called Alan Solly on the relaxed clothing to work uh, kind of concept. There were a lot of other international brands who were trying to come in. Levi's was starting to do work on uh, launch in India. Uh, VF Corporation, Lee Wrangler were doing their, uh, uh, you know, uh, grassroots work to uh, launch in India. There was no department store, there was not even shopper stop in 1992, which came in 94-95. So frankly, if you look at the uh, scene of uh, 1992, uh, it was very, very early stages of development and the first phase of international wholesale brands. Most of the brands I mentioned now are considered as the wholesale brand which sells to a retailer who then eventually retails out to the end consumer. So in 1992, we were <coughs> seeing attempt at launching some international wholesale brands in India. There were no department store. Uh, there was one organization called Madura Garment, which was part of the British uh, Portswaila uh, company, and it was subsidiary in India. So that was a scene in 1992 on the industry side. If I look at today, in uh, <clears throat> 2012, we are very similar. We are also talking about launches. We are also talking about a uh, lot of new brands trying to come in. There are different kinds of brands. There are no more the international wholesale brand. A lot of them are now fully vertically integrated brands. We heard IKEA yesterday. I'm told H&M is uh, knocking on the door. Uniqlo is knocking on the door. So a lot of brands which are fully retail brands, end-to-end, uh, -end, you know, vertically integrated big box brands, either already into India, some of the Inditex brands, or very soon they are planning to launch in India. So we have moved in last 20 years. Uh, what will happen in, uh, you know, 20 years from now, we will discuss because I believe in 20 years, world will be one world. There will be no more launches uh, specific to one country. The world would have become completely one world and all brands would be available by that time in all the countries. 
there will be new brands but there will be global brands so like today iphone 5 is uh, 5 is getting launched but it's getting hopefully launched worldwide something like that would happen in india in and in the world where all over the world will be the same set of brands will get launched and the same set of brands will die across the world so that's one part of the uh, uh you know going back and looking uh, at future second part part i want to look at is the indian economy in 1992 the famous manmohan singh reforms were happening uh, i remember as a student i just walked into industry there a lot of optimism the licensing raj was going out reforms were happening if i look at today still we are talking about reforms another set of reforms another set of industry that time it was uh, you know the car industry automobile uh, pharmaceutical industry textile spindles capacity was being uh, reformed today we are talking about retail we are talking about airlines and we are talking about insurance and pension so a lot of you know the similar wave is happening but in a different format of the indian economy and and we will have to now predict what's going to happen in 2032 what kind of reforms will uh, happen uh, i want to just take one more point of learning from 1992 to today uh, there was a big uh, uh, trend happening from the apparel and retail industry 1992 which was on the west coast of us which was known as friday dressing in the west coast people started wearing relaxed clothes to work for the first time in the history of uh, human kind people started wearing the cotton trousers they started to roll their sleeves and that phenomenon was called known as the friday dressing this is i'm talking about 1992 a brand like dockers they launched their cotton pants uh, which people started wearing to work and then some of the brands in india started to uh, do that today 2012 i think the casualization of the dressing has completely happened and uh, uh, we don't today we don't uh, <coughs> excuse me so i discuss the uh, international brands i am on this slide now social uh, trend so friday dressing was the trend what was happening in 92 today casualization has completely happened and today lot of us wear work uh, jeans to work we wear color pants to work we wear all kinds of crazy things to work so casualization relax uh, relaxation has happened when it comes to the uh, clothing and I, I can predict some sort of in, in my own way what will happen in 2032. I believe space travel will come out of age, and Donald Trump and everybody will make space travel very, very uh, uh, regular thing by 2032. And we could have clothing which will be earmarked for uh, space travel. What will make your space travel comfortable? What will make it efficient? What will make it friendly for a a, a person, a lay person, a rich person who would be actually traveling not to Europe or to US? but to space and and what kind of clothing will be required for him that's what the industry the garment textile industry would be working on uh, today we talk about organic uh, food tomorrow we may be talking about uh, clothing and all the lifestyle about old people because world would have grown much older by that time and maybe the 70s would be the middle age today people are saying in west it's 55 years is the middle age start in india probably people say 45 but by that time maybe it will be 70s the age of people the longevity will go up life expectancy will go up so we will have lot of brands focusing only on uh, older uh, customers so i'm just discussing two uh, uh, sort of uh, scenario here one could be on space travel or other could be as simple as uh, you know taking care of the older customer would be in very large uh, numbers and brands will take that segment very very seriously so that's what i'm trying to do I'm looking at 1992 look at now and then try to see what will happen 20 years from now we are talking about space age we are talking about old age uh, there will be one world the lifestyle kill of the brands will be very less because there will be a lot of competition need for efficiency all brands will be available everywhere in the world you don't have to travel to buy a brand at that point of time but all brands will have to be very very focused niche unique brands which are fulfilling a de definite need of the customer but the life cycle of the brands will be less and people brands will die much faster and the new brands will come out uh, much faster another trend i see in 2032 will be development of these big metros i've used the word megalo it's like megalomaniac we use the word so i'm using this 3 crore 30 million population kind of towns which will be many large towns in uh, the world i can talk about manila in india in asia jakarta our own calcutta madras hyderabad bangalore delhi bombay they'll all be 30 million plus kind of population megalo mani uh, megalo metros and the population will be 30 million and there will be chaos in these cities uh, there is a research which says that eight cities in india will account for 35% of population and bulk of our retail business would be happening in these eight towns but those cities will be very chaotic full of traffic 
uh, you know, it'll be like Japan in many ways that you're taking a very high speed train to go to 100 kilometers to stay and work uh, 100 kilometers away. So the whole this megalo metros existence and development of these megalo metros will make life very different and the retail community will react to this development of these big, big uh, cities. Another comment from my side is about the weather. I believe that the way we are exploiting the natural resources, world will become, weather will become very, very difficult. It will be horrible. Uh, it will be very badly exploited by that time. So we will have all sorts of, you know, weather related issues. So like today talk, people talk about SPF of a certain number. That time we will be talking about clothing which will be uh, for ozone protection. There will be acid rain and we will have umbrellas which will be uh, to protect you or a raincoat or a, something which will uh, help you to go out in uh, outside when there is a acid rain happening. So what I'm trying to say is it will be big size cities, it will be a very very different kind of weather by 2030 and the retail industry will react to some of those needs and try to help the customers with their needs in such environments. Uh, because of traffic and the weather, eventually people would love start shopping from home. Like today, people are working from home in IT industry because of traffic and you know uh, lack of space. It's efficient for a lot of people to work from home. It will become very efficient by that time to shop from home. So, which will mean e-commerce by that time will gain strength and people will prefer to shop from home for most of the things in such bad traffic cities, in such bad weather uh, cities. So, shopping from home will become very important. Shopping from Railway station, which are uh, where you take 100 kilometers to go to work, those kind of places will become important places for retailing for your day-to-day -day, uh, uh, needs. Uh, second point, I'm coming now to fashion retail organization. I see the age of the professional will come down. Today, I see most of the heads of businesses, CEOs, what you call, or MDs, they are all in the late 40s. Uh, <clears throat> but I think by that time, the whole pace of work. Uh, it will be so challenging, need for efficiency, technology will be so high that the age will come down. I think uh, most of the uh, top leaders will be in the late 30s and they'll burn out in by early 40s. Even today in the Western world, most of the top brand CEOs when I meet, they're all in the early 40s. The fashion industries, already I see that senior management is much younger, it's not that older. Uh, but they have all relevant experience, they have worked in the store, so I expect that the age will come down but they will all have worked in the front end, they will have much higher empathy from uh, uh, with the front end and they'll be much younger, uh, un unfortunately they may also burn out uh, faster. <clears throat> this industry could become a 3 trillion today, <clears throat> we are only 200 uh, billion, we are smaller than size of the Walmart in uh, US. Uh, Walmart is a 400 billion dollar company. Uh, Indian uh, retail and organized is only 200, much smaller than the size of Walmart. Walmart US business is 300 billion plus. We are smaller than even the size of Walmart in US today. But finally by 2032, this industry will grow, organized uh, uh, players will grow and it could become a 3 trillion, 4 trillion, some large number will be there, it doesn't matter what that number is. It will be large number and I hope it will be bigger than the size of the Walmart and I'm sure it will be size then size of Walmart Indian uh, organized retail will be bigger than that and we, we will finally other industries will respect uh, retail industry and actually take people from retail industry. Today my batchmates uh, from my MBA they say Kahi nahi to retail mein to job mil hi jayega. You know what they say is if I don't get anything somewhere retail will definitely you know is a place I can go back but that won't happen that time. Retail will be a very respected industry only people with a front end experience would sort of go up and actually it will be a net exporter, exporter of talent to other industry and not an importer like it is today. Last point on the PNL uh, of the retail organization in year 2032. Today retail productivity at least in my industry in fashion and related accessories around a dollar a square foot a day. That's what we call it SSPD, sales per square foot per day. We are at one dollar per square foot per day. I expect there will be large increase in consumption. Though the retail prices at that point have start falling down because of competition, but I see the retail product will be five times what it is today in 20 years. The consumption will go up, people will have more shirts and shoes and bags and wallets and uh, belts in their wardrobe and the fashion industry, the textile industry, the retail industry consumption will go up. Unfortunately, I also see like in US today, discounting will go up, there will be because of competition, because of the... Uh, you know, junior people taking decision on inventory, eventually discounting will go up. But consumers will benefit and the consumption will go up. Margin, IMU, the initial multiplier, what is your landed cost to 
retail price Monday. It, today is three and a half to four. Between three to four is what is the uh, situation today. But when I talk to brands in Europe and US, they are already at six, seven. So I expect that Indian multipliers will also have to go up because there will be inflation, wage cost increase, rentals will continue to be high. We will have higher discounting to uh, discounting to work on. So actually, the industry will, will work with higher multipliers to begin with. Also, the retail margins will go up. Today, when we talked about department store franchises, they take a margin of between 35 to 40 percent. But when I talk to similar people in Europe or US, the, their typical margins is 100 percent, you know, uh, which is on the top down 50 percent plus. And that's how they are able to create category color. You have a shoe category color or a perfume category color in the world, which we don't see in India. People, retailers are struggling with their margin. So by that time, the margins and the trade will go up. Initial multiplier will go up and we'll see finally development of a lot of category killers. Eventually, we'll see the distribution margin will be much higher than the cost of the product sold. So if the retail price would be 100, maybe the product cost will be only 10, 12. The rest of the, uh, the things will be margins and discounting and the government duties and the retailer margin. It's a sad truth as a pure uh, retailer, I feel what we should give to the customer should be mainly what we are charging should be the product what he or she takes back home. But actually in the modern day retail, <clears throat> other costs will be much higher than the cost of the goods sold and, and they will be a high top up of the cost. Cost of capital will be zero. Today in India, if you are a textile manufacturing company, your interest cost could be zero. <clears throat> Center is giving us 5% uh, discount if you are setting up a new greenfield textile uh, fabric plant. So you get on an interest cost of 12%, 5% subsidy from center, it comes down to 7%. Plus Maharashtra and Gujarat is already giving today 5% interest rate uh, subsidy for textile uh, mills. So that 7% can come down to 1% to 2% already in today's time, 2012. Uh, so likewise, by 2032, a lot of industries will see very low cost of capital, which will also fuel their entrepreneurship. A lot of new brands will come up, a lot of new businesses will come up. But the lifespan of those brands and businesses may be small and uh, a lot of new ideas will come and they'll also fade out soon. So the, just to summarize my points, I believe we will have some new segment like space age uh, clothing, space age retailing, old age will become important that se consumer segment. It'll be one world everywhere, it'll be the same number, same kind of brand. There'll not be India launches, there'll be world launches. We will see this megalo metros with three crores kind of population, lot of them in India I see six, seven, cities will have 3 crore plus population by the time, weather will become difficult, people will start finally shopping from home, younger uh, professionals at top level, but with front end stint, it will be a 3 trillion kind of uh, uh, retail industry organized with higher, 5 times higher uh, daily sales productivity. Uh, the margins will go up, uh, <coughs> but the life, type, life cycle of the business could be short at that point of time. That's just the start, I'm sure uh, other panelists have other views similar and probably contrasting and hope that we can have a very interesting discussion. Thank you. But who knows 20 years from now you could advertise your product on the moon so that everybody on earth could see it and it is a reality because you've got a company like Tesla which is working on taking people on personal visits uh, to the moon but let me stick to here and now. Yogesh Samat next with his presentation. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Kocher is a very evil man because he gave us a topic like this and uh, when uh, I got this email into my uh, my inbox what the first thing that hit me was that it makes all of us including my uh, panelists here uh, make us look like Gandalf the White if you are familiar with Lord of the Rings. So suddenly I got this image of me being uh, an old sage trying to uh, kind of see the future in a very interesting way. And then I realized that none of us is actually that young, uh, that old. And uh, but uh, still we shall, uh, you know, uh, persist and try and do the best we can. Now the hard part of a presentation like this usually is that most of the audience really says, tell me something that I don't already know. And uh, with the information age being the age we are present in, I think most of us kind of already know a lot of stuff. So I, I think that this topic in, in a way actually also posed a, a challenge to all of us and as Shailesh went through some of the thoughts he had, so will I. And what he said was true actually because, uh, you know, mostly we can't even see what's going to happen the next year or the year after and it's, uh, 
it's even harder to see 20 years later. So here it goes. We will try. I may be wrong, but then neither am I Gandalf. So I have the right to be wrong in as much as, you know, be able to talk about the future. This presentation, uh, you know, I'm going to just keep, keep it to uh, two or three points. There's a customer side of the story. And for me, I think this is going to be a little more closer than 2032. We'll talk about, I think, how I see the next five years and uh, five to seven years, I would say. And there is a business side to the whole uh, uh, whole story. And then there's a footnote, which I've added, which really actually is food for thought at the end of the presentation. And uh, so that's really what I'm going to talk about. So we'll get on to the customer side. And the first topic actually is about brand nudity. Now, some of us might wonder why am I using a term like this? But the fact is that today brands are seen without clothes in the sense that with technology being the way it is, word of mouth is now replaced by bite of mouth. And uh, just for fun's sake, when I was preparing this presentation, what I did was let me see what happens if I put in a search for a restaurant in Bombay. So I put in a search for, uh, I don't know whether you can see it, but I put in a search for F bar and uh, which is in lower Parel, and instantly I got uh, on top of it I got 71 people who reviewed the restaurant and have uh, given it a rating of 3 on 5 and I have no idea who created those ratings I have no idea what was the basis for the rating but that's really how the customers have rated this place and instantly I think I don't want to go there because why should I waste my time going to a place which is and with due respect to F bar why should I waste my time going to a place which is not rated so well by customers? So today we live in an era where on all your handsets, you have the capacity to shape opinions of brands collectively. And that's a very different time as compared to maybe 10 years ago when none of this was really possible. So then I held myself back and I said, hold it. You know, there's something wrong out here because, uh, okay, it's a restaurant. So let's try and see what happens if I'm going to put my own my, the, the, the company that I run, if I put that brand and see what happens to it. So we run an optician business called Foresight and I ran that and uh, sure enough I got of course where we are located in Bombay and so on and so forth. But more interestingly and I don't know whether some of you will be able to see that circle down there, somebody has actually rated us. You know they have rated us 5 on 5 which I felt really happy about is one person as compared to 71. So I know that but I do know that it's a trend. You know, at some point, you're going to have more and more brands rated openly by public, pretty much like this. And I can't file lawsuits against 3,000, 5,000 people who think badly of me. So it's not going to be easy for us to get rid of it. So you're really an exposed business. All businesses are exposed, not just mine. All of us sitting in this room, our businesses are now open. We are without our clothes. We are as people, as people see us, because that's how customers are rating us. And, uh, you know, this is a bit scary because I got a 5 and I should be feeling very delighted because I got a 5 on 5 from one customer. But I really don't know whether the next customer is going to give me a 5 on 5. We give me a, if he gives me a 1, I get to an average of 3. So we are in an era where no longer are you insulated. Earlier, if there was a PR problem, you know, one customer comes, he's pissed off with us, you know, just go and handle him, pay him off, blah, 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 blah. I can't pay off so many people because they're really our customers. So we are living in a different time right now and that's really what I, I thought. So really, if you, uh, there is the cycle which works pretty much like this, that if you start with the green, there's a customer experience which leads to a customer opinion, which then leads to a bite of mouth from our handsets and then it really exposes the brand fully and for all brands, it's not just us, not just me, it's all of us, not just food brands and some of the big guys in this and this is not uh, this is not uh, necessarily retail and I think most of us are aware of them now there is TripAdvisor, Foursquare, Zomato, IMDB uh, for some of us who like to watch a lot of classic films for example uh, I've kind of taken a view that I will not watch any film which has been released in the past unless it has a rating of 7.5 and that's just my own instinct taking feedback from and this is rated by customers so really uh, and it's all there. And if you think that this is all Hollywood, but let me assure you, if you put a, a Hindi film also, you'll get a equally, uh, you know, diverse kind of a response and they'll have an average rating and you know what needs to be done. 
So some of these players which are there and they're going to increase in numbers. It's not that it's going to stay this way. Right now they're all sectoral, but they're going to increase in number. And uh, you know, there is some kind of a wisdom which is evolving. There is a there is a book that was written some time back about wisdom of crowds. And there is truly some kind of wisdom evolving because it's actually egging us to improve ourselves. It's trying to make us better. I think Facebook, for example, which we are all aware of, has become a fantastic uh, you know, tool for us to actually see what the customers think of us. And uh, finally, if you take this step further, you can actually get your customer to shape your product. And that is even more fascinating. That I see is a big trend coming in the next few years. Because no longer, you know, I think a lot of people used to provide lip service saying, we don't own the brand, the customer owns the brand. But the moment it comes to the design for the next season, I need to know, I need to see what's going to happen to it and so on and so forth. So that's all changing now because let's take the case of uh, a brand called Jones, which is a, uh, it's a soft drink, it's a soda brand in the US. All these labels, uh, the, the, the visuals on them have been provided by customers. They are not provided by the, the, the brand manager or the advertising firm that does the builds the brand. They are provided by customers and they are, they are different for each bottle. There's another, uh, the, you know, so you can actually go to the site and uh, have your own soft drink label. And this is the way it actually comes on the site. Say yes to my Jones and you kind of upload your picture and you kind of uh, send it off to them. And lo and behold, you've got your own own uh, bottle. So what actually is happening is that the customer is shaping the product for the first time in, in human history is really a customer directly acting on a product. So far there were intermediaries which is the management of a firm that was responsible for it but increasingly that's kind of being sidelined and we're just brokers in the process of actually shaping brands in the future. So what happens in the business side of this? Let's now come to the business side and uh, and see what happens as a result of it. And actually interesting things also happen on the business side as a result of this. Uh, the fact is that if you were to you know, uh, look at this whole process of uh, manufacturing. Manufacturing has improved to a point which allows us to make small production lots, that allows us to create mass customization. Mass customization gives customers a psychological benefit of actually saying that I own the product, this product is mine, I've, I've worked on it and it's mine. And when you leverage that with IT, which is your own, uh, the, the, the in computer, the internet, connectivity, the smartphones, you really are able to do a lot of this stuff, which is very different from earlier times. And especially the combination of manufacturing technology across all sectors, whether it's in fashion, whether it's in food, across all sectors, manufacturing has really changed now. Smaller production lots are easier and so on and so forth. And let me, this is not mass stocking. A lot of people say, no, 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 but we'll keep all the SKUs, we should be all right. This is not mass stocking. This is actually products being designed by customers for themselves. And you really don't have a role apart from just being the person who's actually doing it for them. So Adidas, for example, has this uh, my, uh, my, my Adidas, which is really uh, feedback from customers, designs made by customers. They have kind of manufactured it and now they put it online so customers can buy, other customers can buy those designs. These are not done in the, by the design team of Adidas, but they are done by customers within a certain set of options. Uh, cereal bars, you can actually now customize your own cereal bar, what you like, pick it off and uh, maybe in a couple of weeks you'll find it in your, at your home delivered. And we must recognize that this is not going to be something that's going to be bought on the shelf in the store. It's going to come straight to your home. And therefore, for retailers, it is no longer a case of saying, how am I going to pay for the real estate? Because that's a really big question after some time. Because if a lot of your business actually goes offline, online, sorry, and it's not offline anymore, then what's going to happen to the real estate that we're occupying? Uh, absolute Vodka is releasing 4 million unique bottles of vodka. So you can actually own your personalized absolute bottle. And uh, again, all because of manufacturing technology that allows customers, that allows you to choose the kind of product that you would like. It's no longer a single product, a single brand, a single toothpaste, which is going to cater to you. And we're going to blast it on media, television, so on, so on, so forth. 
muesli you can design your own muesli now you can decide what you want to keep inside your calorie count comes everything comes to you and it so these are just some examples that i have given uh the same thing goes with with fashion for example you can alter you can you can get uh, jeans customized you can get jewelry and a whole lot of other categories it's all there online we can do it today and yeah, and this is just the start it's going to get more and more uh, interesting as we go along the volumes will pick up and uh, unless we alter the fundamental way we see our business i think some of us will find it really hard going and uphill going there so actually where does this leave retailers like us people like us who are there retailers where does it actually leave us and that's a good question because if you are a manufacturer retailer as selish put it if you are a integrated brand from manufacturing to retail i think it you should be pretty happy because you can make fantastic products and which people can see through and directly organize your brand feedback will be great and uh, you can innovate on that basis you can create customized offering and the whole loop can be a nice friendly positive loop you can do all that but what happens to retailers who are not integrated single brand retailers if you're a pure play retailer which means that you got to be afraid you got to be very afraid and the reason is because no longer is going to be mere aggregation of brands adequate just simply saying i'm going to keep this brand this brand this brand this brand and i'm going to create a retail concept is really going to be tough in the future and the reason is because earlier the role of retail was to break bulk okay we organize a large lot we divide it among stores and we get it cheaper therefore we make some money and it was meant to be like aggregating quality products but e-commerce and commoditization is making the roles completely redundant so actually the ones that will be under pressure in the coming future really would be department stores hypermarkets and multi brand specialty retailers uh, which really have nothing else except to say that i've got good brands along with me next to each other so customers will hopefully come and buy it from us because we are not adding value to the process and the idea always and it we go back to the first principle that we got to find a way to create magic we got to find a way to create magic in our stores that customers come to us and unless we do that in unique ways and in contemporary ways we will not succeed and the reason is you know because our vendors are innovating better than us we run for example i run a multi brand uh, retail format uh, which has many many brands together and no longer can i say that i've got good brands with me therefore i think customers will buy from us and because i think we use the word vendor and i think that using the word vendor itself is i think a pretty negative term because they are innovating better than us they are smarter than us and we need to change ourselves uh, much faster than 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 we imagine so uh, you know from a innovation standpoint really if you ask me uh, there is there is a uh, anything that saves time effort or gives us pleasure or helps us in our circle which is really the circle of family us family society is really what's going to work in the future people talk about the earth that we got to save the earth we got to make a greener company and so on and so forth but i think i agree with what selish said it's still lip service i think the earth is getting pretty much ruined by what we're doing and i think that all of us tend to be unless very strong legislation comes i don't see that really sorting itself out in a hurry so to me that's still out of the circle it's not part of the circle that we 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 claim it to be and the two enablers that have really helped us in the process has been the smartphone and the apps that come on your smartphone that's really what what has changed the way brands are being increasingly managed and handled and just to, just to give you a quick idea of how these things are shaping technology is shaping uh, very quickly the 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 businesses today uh some of the white goods businesses are now getting into people less kiosks so really you can actually go to a slot machine almost like a slot machine you can go swipe your card buy a product and it's no longer the case of saying that i'll buy a soft drink it is now you can buy an ipod or in fact many many more products which are directly through people less kiosks that's a very big innovation that has happened in the last in the last i think 8 uh, to 10 years and it's going to increasingly come to be and uh, the second actually is something which is also equally interesting is self checkout because that's something which is not present in india because we think we've got a lot of people but i think our productivity is are really low and therefore i think eventually this is going to come and a very clear example is how many of us actually now do self check uh, self check ins at the airports for example where you don't require any human intervention everything is almost automated 
So these are two interesting innovations also apart from the overall direction in which customers and, and so eventually what we are saying is that brands are, 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 are now being shaped by customers. Small production lots allow, will allow people to define the products for them. So it's my kind of product. And these two things are going to change really radically the way business is actually being conducted. And as a footnote, I do believe that Bill Gates was wrong. He wrote in 1995, and this is really, it's written there, uh, that we tend to overestimate the change that will occur in the next two years, but underestimate the change in 10 years. And so don't get lulled into inaction. This is what he wrote in 1995, and I think he's wrong. Because when we step back, and uh, and I, I'm sorry, I, I actually is a billionaire, so he cannot be wrong. But uh, when you step back and you really see what was predicted on Indian retail, we were supposed to be in fourth gear now. We were supposed to be in fourth gear now. This is a 2002 study which said that new entrants will come in, markets will grow, and in you know in about 10 years from now, retail will have would have come of age. And I think all of you, I'm sure, would agree with me that. We probably have just crossed the first stage now. So this is one instance where we we've, we've actually underestimated the amount of time it's going to take for retail to evolve in this country. And uh, and it's really going to take a little longer than this. My sense is that it will probably take another 10 to 15 years before retail truly comes of age in this country. But he was also right on two counts. He was right here. And this is from the book which is uh, The Road Ahead. Please don't read that book. It's very boring. So uh, this is really all there is to it. And uh, what he wrote was that, uh, you know, and, and it's very true and I'll leave it to you to read it. And especially the last point, which is the basis on which I really made underscored some of the points that I had to make out here. With that, I, th I end the presentation. Thank you. Yogesh, thanks very much. Some terrifying scenarios. I mean, especially what you painted for pure play retailers. But on the other hand, some exciting ones. And here I'm talking as a customer, brand nudity and the fact that customers are going to shape the brands of the future. Taking stage now, Sanjay Kapoor. Morning, everyone. Um, Yogesh rightly pointed out that when Jian reached out with the um, with the topic for the uh, speech for today, I was like, if I could actually crystal gaze and figure out what the world would be like, I'd be a genius or very, very rich. In any case, what my presentation is going to be a little different. Um, uh, this is just going to be my thought processes of what retail is going to look like 20 years from now. Uh, I'm going to break this conversation up into two parts, actually. One is um, how India is going to be an integral part of the global market. Two, how brands will use technology to engage with customers. The new era of e-tailing. And lastly, a hope is that India would use its cultural heritage to promote retail. Um, I think the theme behind this is also retailing going forward is going to be more interactive. It's already started and it's going to get even better. So retail 20 years from now, India is not going to be the next China, but I think we're going to leap forward to the next level. Even today, there are lots of comparisons. Um, I, I was reading somewhere the other day that in the main newspapers, we have about 100 articles a year in which China compare, India compares itself with China. China, of course, compares itself with the United States and not with India. Uh, and when you talk to brands and how they look at India vis-a-vis -vis China, India has got a lot more culture, it's got a lot more let's say, discrepancy on how, how they buy, you can influence thoughts more. So here's what I'd love to see. I'd love to see India as an integral part of the global market. Brands which would already started creating processes and products for India would create more and more products. Right here, the, the red jacket you see is a jacket by Kanali. It's called the Kanali Nawab. It's specially made for India. It's sold only in India. The bag on the left is a product by Jimmy Choo called the Jimmy Choo Chandra. Again, sold only in India, made specifically for India. I'd love to see more and more products like this made for the Indian market to be sent out to the global market. Brands would, I think, be also appreciated more for craftsmanship and not just mere logos. Today in Asia, not just in India, but if you see across Asia, logos are selling. Um, as more and more wealth gets created in the world, I think people will appreciate products just for the product itself. The new era of technology. This is what I said about brands interacting with customers. I don't know if any of you read about the new Burberry store that opened up in Regent Street about a couple of weeks ago. It's a 45,000 square feet techno crazy flagship store where you can actually pick up a product which is coded with RIFD technology. You wear the jacket and you look in the mirror and the mirror will showcase how that jacket was on the runway. We'll give you different other examples of how you could wear the jacket. 
if it's being programmed and it even talk about how the jacket was made and the process behind it. So the tiny little chips that are embedded into the clothes that send information to, to the screens and the mirrors. I mean, that's taking technology and clothing really to the next level. And I've actually seen this myself. So this is not a science fiction movie or, uh, you know, Star Trek where you're actually imagining things, but it's happening today. Can you imagine what technology is going to take it 20 years down the road? For any of you who have not seen this, worth getting on the net and actually checking out the store. So, you know, stuff that's already been covered, but, you know, the new era of e-tailing, globally available brands across product supply chain will become much better. Today in India, most of the e-commerce businesses, I think, are running more of a supply chain. Uh, because, really, that is the bottleneck in the business right now. So, I think e-commerce will be matching the human brain by using a sixth sense technology. I have a short two-minute video, which I'd love to show you right now. Product. The system can recognize the product that he's picking up using either image recognition or marker. Let's go from the beginning on that. Jim Cruz in Minority Report. Um, the reason why we're really excited about this device is that it um, really can act as one of these sixth sense devices that gives you relevant information about uh, whatever is in front of you. So we see Pranav here going into the supermarket and he's uh, shopping for some paper towels. And as he picks up a product, the system can recognize the product that he's picking up using either image recognition or marker technology and give him the green light or an orange light. Um, he can ask for additional information. So this particular... Um, <laughs> choice here is a particularly good choice given his personal criteria. Some of you may want the toilet paper with the most bleach in it rather than the most ecologically <laughs> responsible choice. Um, but <laughs> If he picks up a book in the bookstore, he can get the Amazon rating, gets projected right on the cover of the book. This is uh, Juan's book, our previous speaker, um, which gets a great rating, by the way, at Amazon. And so Pranav turns the page of the book and can then see additional information about the book, reader comments, uh, maybe sort of information by his favorite critic, etc. If he turns to a particular page, he finds an annotation by maybe an expert of a friend of ours that gives him a little bit of additional information about whatever is on that particular page. Reading the newspaper, it never has to be outdated. <laughs> So just taking forward more with the technology, you'll actually have virtual window displays. Again, the key word out here is interactivity with the consumer. There is just so much choice available. Customers need to interact with products and brands to make choices. Paperless billings, retailers can use this to ecologically friendly, safe paper. Lastly, India. Where do we see ourselves in India? I expect that we'd have advanced infrastructure in some, many of the metros and in the smaller cities. Some of the new developments you see, including some of the developments showcased here at RRR. Incredible buildings, new technology, new types of malls. Infrastructure would go beyond the metros. You know, very often um, we get asked, what has Singapore or Dubai really done to get retailing as an important aspect of the economy? I don't think in India we'd really want to compete with them. but. There's a huge amount of old heritage that we can do. I'd love to see some of those heritage malls, heritage sites being promoted as malls. If you go to countries like Singapore, they've translated old churches and old schools into fashion areas and eateries and stuff like that. We have so much heritage and culture in our country. Can we use some of these sites as malls? I think that would be different. It would create some excitement. It would interact and mix shopping with entertainment. Thanks very much, Sanjay. We've got about 20 minutes. Um... I have a couple of questions and I'm going to pose them to the panel, then we'll open it up to the audience for discussion. 
Yugesh, you first. I mean, uh, much of what you described in your presentation uh, was about, you know, brand nudity and mass customization is what you refer to it as. Uh, you know, what does it do then to the brand custodian, i.e. the owner of the brand, if there are all these customers out there who are determining the look, the feel, the touch, the impact of the brand, then as the owner, what control do you have over it? And this is a scenario, right, that you see 20 years from now in India? Yeah, actually, uh, Manvi, that's a, that's a really difficult question because sometimes even I don't know. Uh, when you've, uh, and I think 20 years, is, I, I think it's about three to five years uh, before. In, in, no kidding. I mean, uh, yeah, what, three to three five years, five you're going to have. Uh, We've got bets on the table. Anybody, then. yeah, you've got everybody having a point of view and posting it onto certain sites. And you, and, and you know, I think a lot of companies have very strong PR engines that make sure that any bad publicity is kept out. But uh, how are you going to defend yourself? Uh, you know, it's pretty much like how these political uh, scams have got public and then they go all over the network and so on and so forth. So really, you're exposed. So uh, I think that the answer perhaps lies in simply saying that we have to keep doing a better job every day and much more than we've done in the past. And uh, uh, in some sense, we need to be very sensitive to how customers see us and what customers believe that we are. We got to keep really, I mean, you got to have multiple and, ways and of... And yet thick skin to continue functioning. Otherwise, there could yeah. be paralysis e based on multiple opinions. Yeah, you got to, and in any case, positioning is based on the, on the fundamental premise that some people are going to love you and some people are going to hate you. So I'll rather, you know, address, the, uh, address that polarity and live with it. And uh, managing it itself is going to be quite a task. And it's in about three to five years, not, not, not really very far. Sanjay, in your presentation, what came through is that much of the future lies in technology and the way you deploy and use it. And yet, the sense that I get, and perhaps I'm wrong, uh, yesterday, today, talking, listening to sessions here, the obsession is about real estate, managing that cost, managing that investment. I haven't heard, at least in the public forum, much um, uh, thought on, you know, what's our technology outlay? How much are we really gearing up for the kind of future that you just, well, it's actually the present at the Burberry store. Um, how much of the mind space is it occupying for you? How much of the mind space should it occupy for everybody sitting in this room? Technology. I think technology occupies a huge amount of mind space. May not be so much actually in the investment in money right now. It definitely occupies, I would say, a quarter of my mind space because that's how fast the world is changing, right? I mean, uh, today in India, still in e-commerce, we're really selling music, books, electronics. We're really not selling fashion, mostly because of our delivery system. But that's going to change very rapidly. We have to think for the future. Um, I know, in, you know, the other thing is real estate is always going to be scarce in India, right? So technology is going to leapfrog that for us where you're not going to have any rental costs. Sounds very utopian, but it'll get there someday. And it sounds like a relief from the agony which uh, many retailers are currently experiencing on the... Lower the rents. <laughs> uh, Chalish, you know, what I, just harking back to your presentation, uh, much of it was... Um, about how consumers are going to shop and actually where they're going to shop. And that ties in with what all three of you have said. Um, so a pure play retailer, which has a large space and all these products out there, I mean, what are we saying that they're going to be, I'm, I don't know if I dare say that word, but redundant? Look at, uh, you know, this is all crystal gazing. We don't know what's going to happen, but... I, like, I repeat and underline, this is crystal gazing. So <laughs> give us some room for maneuver here. You know, look at uh, a consumer. Let's then work backward to what retailers should do. I see that today increasingly we have these uh, uh, workstation at home that, you know, you're keeping uh, your office, uh, Soho, small office, home office. Probably you will keep a small area in the house for shopping. That this is one area where, you know, that woman wants to say that this is my area, is me space or my space where... You would just say, when I want to feel like buying my new handbag, I'm going to go to that space and I'm going to use the technology around that to actually then do shopping of my makeup or beauty or handbag. I think something like that will happen. There will be a, a dedicated space in the residences to help you shop actually. And it could be grocery, it could be fashion, it could be banking, it could be anything else. Now, I don't you know, believe that the pure play retail will sort of uh, not exist. Eventually, you know, retailers are smart business people. They'll figure out what needs they fulfill. So, for example, I see 
airport if everybody going to travel 100 kilometers then the metro station will become an important point for people to shop or airports will increasingly become more because already you see the way you know the airlines or air travel in a life has really gone up in last 20 years and in the next 20 years it's going to be increasingly go so probably airports will become a more pure play retail so instead of going to a traditional house, let's say South X or GK in Delhi, you might actually look at T3 as the pure retail And plan place. your shopping yeah. so ahead of your trip. Yeah, the location might change, but somewhere you will still connect with the uh, retailer in a brick and mortar mm -hmm. sense and a touch and feel way and probably not on a high street, maybe at the airport. Okay, I'm going to ask each of you what I consider a tough question. Based on your projection of the world 20 years from now, Give me an example of what you're doing within your own organizations, which is futuristic, which is risky, but which is anticipating a slightly wild trend that may emerge up there in the future. I'll leave it to you to decide who's going to go first. I mean, you know, I want to understand, are you all actually thinking about some of the wild cards out there? And if so, can you share an example? Can I be honest with you? My answer to that is empower more and more younger people. I'm the wrong profile to be thinking of what's going to happen 20 years from now. Today, we have more and more people in their mid and late 20s making decisions. And we're even getting younger and younger in an organization because they need to think. I mean, I can't think like they think. Sometimes I, I come out of a meeting of with six 20-something-year-old kids, as I call them. I'm like, wow, I've learned a hell of a lot. So I think to me, really... You can't predict the future, you can't predict change, but really you've got to start with the youth because that's what's going to come up. And, and you know, that's what Shailesh acknowledged uh, as well. I mean, even the CEO's age, yippee, is going to be late 30s instead of late 40s. I think I see the difference even today uh, uh, in Europe and US. Uh, it's not surprising. Let's say I, I worked with a brand called Esprit and the CEO was early 40s and it's seven, eight <clears throat> billion dollar brand. And today... In India, a 500 crore brand probably will be handled by a late 40, early 50 guy. So there's already a five to eight years uh, age gap in today's time. But <clears throat> I believe India will become, it'll become, it'll merge with the world. What happens in 20 years will be one world. India and world will be same. So I see here also, like anywhere in the world, late late 30s uh, uh, kind of, uh, or maybe younger people would be uh, running the organization and probably they burn out faster there. I, I see that you all have all three very deftly avoided my question. <laughs> no, is there something that you're doing today in an anticipation for a crazy, unpredictable I, trend that may emerge I, I, in the future? I'll take that question. Sanjay did uh, answer that question about age of... You know, there are two things I, I want to comment on your question. One is, whatever happens to the world, one thing is that we as head of organization, we want our organization to increasingly become more and more customer-centric. It doesn't matter whether you are in 2012 or it's going to be 2032. Uh, <clears throat> as the consumer need change and as competition emerge faster and more focus, more niche competition, I think we need our organization to remain extremely alert and very customer centric. So that is increasingly, you know, you don't have time to sort of not react. We'll be very alert and look at what needs we can fulfill of the customer. So one thing surely being more and more customer centric. Second point I would say is that while a lot of changes and chaotic changes and, you know, major changes, uh, you know, will happen, we will still get opportunity to steer businesses in one direction. I'll give you an example. Uh, there's a brand in Hong Kong called, it's, it's, a, it's a French brand in Hong Kong called uh, Anais B, Agnes B. And uh, in a market which is full of discounting, even today, they don't discount. Uh, what their point of view is that we will create very good collection, and but we will not go on discount two times a year, a very, very aspirational brand. And they, they are able to steer their business in one particular direction, very successful. i give you an, another example and final example, Walmart. US is the mecca of discounting. They look for a day and a labor day and a president day and a Monday to give discount. Now, in that market, here is one brand selling very basic products as everyday cheap prices. They, we don't jack up our multipliers and then give discount. We'll keep it very tight and we'll give and they've built a 400 uh, billion dollar business. So they have a point of view and they're steering the consumers towards that, that direction. So I think we will get increasingly higher chances to steer our businesses, not less. As the market opens up, as the consumer needs change, as the consumption goes up, I think we will get a lot of opportunity to steer our businesses toward a point of view that we believe in. 
But sure, steering is going to be more challenging. Of course, and more exciting. Yogesh? Uh, I think that, uh, uh, you know, technology is really something that I've spent a lot of time on in the last few, uh, last couple of years because I'm seeing the way we all have, you know, it's so strange. About 20 years ago, uh, we got a 40 MB computer in the office and everybody was joyous. Now, now much something much more powerful is on everybody's hands. So, uh, I believe that there is a physical world and there's a virtual world and we've always sensed the physical world is bigger because that's what we can see visually with our eyes. But there's a virtual world which is now we're recognizing is far, far bigger. And uh, the capacity of an organization to be able to make the interaction with customers seamless or apparently seamless is really where a lot of my thought is going because and that requires a lot of investment in time, uh, a lot of investment actually thinking through how customers buy and how is it that on their ha on their handset, like I'll give an example, uh, uh, the prescription for a, for, a, for a spectacles, why is it that still we give a physical card out? Why can't it just be on your handset through the website, you go in and you do it? So, I mean, this is just one very, very basic example of how the world is changing and how information storage. So, holding information, earlier it was the case that I keep the prescription because the customer has to come back to me. And so, he will buy again from me. But now, actually, democratization of the information really is power. So, we're working a lot in these areas, which I think uh, will obviate some of the issues that real estate poses to us in this country. That's really where it is. Okay, time for some questions, and I hope there are a couple of them. Do raise your hand, introduce yourself, and go right ahead uh, if you want to pose it to one panelist or all of them. First of all, let me thank all the three of you for a wonderful presentation. But uh, this is uh, to Silesh. It is really good to be positive, but can you elaborate on what are the important points that everyone, every entrepreneur should keep in mind to ensure longevity of his or her business model? Take the example of Deccan Airlines or Kingfisher or even in the retail space, there are many people who have come in but then they expected something but they didn't achieve it over a period of time and then they have burned out. My question is, how can platforms such as IRF galvanize support for a time-based affirmative action from various agencies that can catapult growth of the retail segment? I'm not really sure that the mandate of our topic today, which is crystal gazing yeah, that, 2032 yes. trends, um, really covers your question because you're looking at, you know, A, why do business models go wrong? What is the longevity of business models? And part B, which is can a gathering like this, an association like this, really do something to handhold those who stumble or need some support That's along right. the way? Not really within um, our topic, but if one of you would like to answer it, feel free. I believe, uh, I said that businesses will fail more. So, so I'm actually saying, you know, working on you the same anxiety that you're saying that as businesses become more competitive, as businesses become more niche, uh, give you an example, there's a Portuguese brand called Desigual, which came with a very you know, unique point of view and everybody liked it. But then it's so unique that after buying the second shirt, third shirt, people don't want to buy the fifth shirt from them. Uh, likewise, a lot of other brands. So people, businesses will fail. In fact, in this platform, what we can make everybody conscious is that we beware that businesses are increasingly likely to fail. So it's not something that you can prevent. That's the force of, you know, increased competition. Businesses will surely fail. Airlines will fail. Retail brands will fail. All businesses will fail. So point is, what we can do probably in a platform like this to make everybody alert that the fatality, the mortality rate is going to go up. So be careful. Someone, I think Yashan said, you know, we were supposed to be in fourth gear now. This is coming to, you know, the topic which we are crystal gazing. Now, is it that we have underestimated time or is it co coordinating agencies, I include the government also there, that needs to be more proactive? I think that question was directed to me because that was the subject of my uh, presentation. I think, uh, you know, there is a physical uh, effort. It's like, uh, I often say this to a lot of people that, you know, you take a, 10 year old child and then tell that 10 year old child that look uh, get a PhD and the child will take another maybe 15 years and get a PhD but then you say no 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 I think that you don't have to do it in uh, 10 years uh, in, in 15 years you have to do it in 2 years the child will not get a PhD at the age of 12 so there is a certain amount of time that gets you know a lot of people say we should have done it faster but if you really go back to 
for example, the US, which is a very good example of how retail actually matured. They took the 50s, 60s and 70s, which is 30 years before really retail came of age, physical retail, the way we understand it, came of age over there. And we've given ourselves 10 years. I think we really underestimated the task in hand. There is really a lot more work to get done. I think we're going to take another 15 years. That's my judgment. Assuming that the uh, technology doesn't, you know, create any more disruptions. This question is for uh, Sanjay. Uh, Sanjay, I just wanted to ask you, you had a very short presentation, uh, you know, on the fact that you're going to get a younger generation in place and, uh, you know, infrastructure and technology, uh, things which are going to change in 2030. So apart from this, what is it that's going to take uh, India ahead of China? Because I already see that that country is uh, way ahead in terms of at least infrastructure and technology than our country is. So more than getting the younger generation in place, and I'm one of those late 20-something kids, uh, you know, who has this question for you. So, you know, I just wanted to understand your thought process on that because they are way ahead of us. You know, so it's going to take us a long time, I feel, you know, in terms of technology and infrastructure anyway. So anything that can fast track our country that, that you think, uh, you know, take us ahead. So I think two things. Um, a, yes, the comparison has been made very often, and you're right, China is miles ahead of us in infrastructure. I wouldn't say the same on technology, but two things I think would make a difference. A, I think there's a very strong inbuilt entrepreneurial spirit in Indians that you may not see in China. I mean, if you if you take the highway from Delhi to Agra, right. and you stop at a tea stall there, and you ask that seven-year-old kid who shouldn't be working there, he should be in school, and you ask him, what do you, do, what do you want to be when you grow up? And the kid's probably going to say, I want to own the tea stall. Okay, so I think that's one difference that we have in our culture, which yeah. is going to help us leapfrog. And I think the other thing that we really have is a democracy, which is obviously very negative too in terms of ruling. But hopefully if the government gets its act into shape, I think that's also going to help us. We are by and large a peaceful, loving country. And I obviously don't want to get into what we, what we do good about it. But I think these two things is going to change it. China has followed in terms of the retailing business, really the model is just ape the West. You come up with a brand, you put in a foreign label to it, really everything and anything sells. We are far more discerning about it. I think our policies have hampered us for going fast, but I think the people are going to make the difference. And you know, just referring to your presentation as well, I don't, you know, the two planks, infrastructure, technology that China is riding on and the American model, the points that you made as far as uh, crystal gazing for Indian retail 20 years from now is customization for India, using some of the culture, heritage of India and weaving it into uh, retail. So I think that makes it unique to India and there can't be an India-China comparison, right? We're also a very proud nation, I must tell you this. So that adds a lot of difference. So China will definitely, it's, it's going to continue staying a superpower, right? So we would be better than them in some things and worse off in some things. And if you're 20-something, go with your heart. Don't think, don't use your head too much. Okay, one more question, then we're out of time. Uh, my question is for Sanjay as well. Uh, Sanjay, in your presentation, you started with saying uh, that India will be an integral part of the global market. International brands will be making merchandise for India. Do you see India making, developing, building a luxury brand? Why is it? that we cannot aspire to be there. We are so proud to have all the luxury brands that Genesis brings to us here in India. Uh, but why is it there no effort from anyone to develop, build an India luxury brand? A brand that globally people will sort after. So you said something very close to my heart and I do believe we will get there. Today, um, you know, when we started our heritage around clothing and fashion, we started off as a manufacturer. Today, I don't think India is ready or has created a global brand because global brand and brands are primarily about marketing also. You know, I mean, brands get created when you spend 20 to 40% of the top line on just brand creation and brand marketing, right? We will get there. India will have its own version of a Shanghai tank. It will be there. I think we're just evolving. Today, the world is looking at India because their markets have saturated. And our markets are growing very rapidly. I mean, even in the slowdown today, many retailers are seeing 20% like-on-like -like growth over the last year. Anybody who's running a fairly successful business would have seen that. That would happen. I think that's going to be the next evolution. Anytime someone asks me, why don't you take your brand Satyapal globally? I say, there's enough of a market out here in India. Let me saturate India before I become global. 
it's very cool to have a a store you know in london or new york or dubai but i see the market so much so much of an existing market in india for the next 10 years before we look globally we're all out of time thank you very much uh, for being a part of this session and of course uh, yogesh shailesh sanjay thanks very much too